Uh, our amazing Jewish heritage is the first thing we need to think about. And this is what, from St. Augustine on, has been sought to be eradicated from the church. Uh, St. Augustine, or Augustine, in, the, in the, um, the Byzantine Empire of Rome, he was from Hippos, uh, the north shore, or the, the uh, northern part of Africa, the south shore of the Mediterranean. But uh, St. Augustine wanted to basically um, get rid of this and replace it with this. He was the start of the uh, replacement theologians who, by the way, now populate all the major denominations, uh, including, you know, Wheaton in Chicago. I mean, these replacement people believe that God is absolutely done with the Jewish people. Uh, they crucified Christ and rejected him, and all of the promises to Israel now are given to the church. And that's where a lot of the, the, the crazy um, fringe of the charismatics get some of those incredible health, wealth, and prosperity verses because they, they pluck promises for the geography of the Holy Land and for the nation of Israel, and they apply those to the church. But just for you to think about, we have a very amazing Jewish heritage. This evening, every one of us, if we succumb to you know, heart failure in this auditorium or die in a car accident on the way home, are headed to a city made by God. He calls it New Jerusalem. Now, if that isn't a tie to something, you know, you're missing the boat. Heaven is called the New Jerusalem. It's not called you know, the New Kalamazoo uh, or the New Rome. It's the New Jerusalem. What's interesting about it is it has 12 gates by which you enter the city and those for eternity are going to have the names of 12 apostles who just happen to all be Jews. Isn't that interesting? And the 12 foundations that are going to have those names, they're named. Just like the gates are going to have the 12 apostles' names, the foundations are going to have forever the 12 tribes of Israel. So it's really interesting. What I think about, especially when you get to Revelation 7 and Revelation 14, uh, where the replacement theologians say that that is not talking about 12 tribes of Israel because God is through with Israel. Well, I wonder what the 12 foundation stones are for then, if God is through with them. But forever there is a merging of the, the two peoples of God, not an erasure of either one of them. Uh, the, the 12 gates, 12 apostles speaking of the church, the 12 foundations, 12 tribes speaking of Old Testament, and Revelation 7 and 14, which talks about the 144,000, which are made up of 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. That, that means that there is a future plan that God has for Israel, right down to the tribal designations that only God would know. So that's very interesting, very Jewish. God sits on a hill called Mount Zion. That's where he says his throne is. Zion. That's fascinating. Uh, we are heading to a feast, and this is really interesting. And I'm going to show you this. Jesus said to the people, to a Gentile, Jesus spoke about this in Matthew 8, to a Gentile a centurion, who had great faith in Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, I haven't seen faith like that nowhere before. That's amazing. And he says, you know what? You, Mr. Centurion, are going to come with many other people from the east and from the west. In other words, from outside of Israel. And all of you that are, in other words, embracing the gospel, are going to sit down in heaven at a feast and get seated next to, that's amazing. So the Gentile converts, when they get saved and go to heaven, are going to sit down at a banquet, and already seated at the banquet are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I thought, I thought we were, they were, uh, you know, I mean, to read replacement theologians, I mean, you'd think 
that maybe they're not even going to be allowed in uh, to heaven. So look at the text. This is Matthew 8. Jesus' astounding statement reminding us of the Jewishness of, of our faith. Now, the wall of division between the Jews and Gentiles, Paul clearly said, has been broken down. And there is no greater access through Jews to Christ than there is through Gentiles. There is no, no access to God that, that is enhanced by keeping Jewish traditions and Jewish feasts and Jewish diets and Jewish dress codes, you know, having the little tassels hanging out, you know, that show you're, you're really into Jewishness. No. But the centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy. You should come under my roof. By the way, Matthew 8 through 10 is a series of, remember what Matthew was? What was Matthew? The what? Tax collector. He's an accountant. Uh, Even though recently the IRS director said they didn't know much about numbers, people that collect taxes should know a lot about numbers. He was like a CPA. So Matthew loved to put everything in groupings. And what Matthew does is, unlike Mark and Luke, Matthew groups Miracles together, parables together. You know, he, he does groupings. He, he is not a real chronological gospel writer. And so he strings together uh, a whole series of miracles that happen across Christ's ministry. And we're right in the middle of those. And, and it's fascinating to watch the lessons that Jesus brings out from these miracles. So it's the centurion. And he said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I'm a man under authority. I have soldiers under me. And I say this one, go. And he goes, and another come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this. And he does it. And when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed. Now he's speaking to the, to the Jewish people that were following along. And this is a Gentile. This is a uh, Roman centurion from some part of the empire. We don't know where. And, and Jesus said, As surely I say unto you, those who are following him, uh, I have not found such great faith, no, not even in, uh, I'm going to turn that off so it won't bother us. It probably doesn't bother you, but it bothers me that uh, it keeps coming on. There we go. Um, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say unto you that many will come. Now Jesus is talking about the the long-term impact of his ministry and the gospel going into all the earth and preaching the gospel. That's Matthew 28. And they're going to come, these converts, many are going to believe the gospel. And they're going to come from the east and from the west and sit down. Who's already seated? In Jesus, as he's speaking about. And, And often, Jesus speaks of heaven as a banquet. Uh, to, to Jewish people, the majority of whom in Christ's time had to work every day. There were three types of people. There were rich people. Uh, rich people, they had enough that they didn't need to work that day. Then there were poor people, and a poor person was defined as someone who worked all day long to get enough money on their way home to buy food that would cover the next day. And that food that covered the next day was there as they went and worked all day long to earn enough money to buy food for the next day. So they were living day to day, which tells you a little bit about chapter 6. Give us this day our what bread? Daily bread. The, the Lord's Prayer is people that were on a daily connection with food, with their necessities. They were not rich, in other words, they could go for a while just from their reserves, their savings, the food they had stored. There were few rich, there were most poor, they were day-to-day workers, and then the word in the Sermon on the Mount that says the poor in spirit is actually absolutely desolate, and an absolutely desolate person uh, is someone who didn't even have enough food for today. So there are three levels of people, and uh, few of these, most people making just enough money to earn their food for, that, for the following day, and then that group of beggars that were absolutely desolate, and they only could eat what they were given at the moment. Because the, the vast majority of people were like this, to say heaven was like a banquet, 
A banquet was, you didn't have to work for it. It was all you could eat, and it was there. To them, that was kind of like the greatest thing they could think of, that, that they wouldn't have to worry about the mice eating their food. They wouldn't have to worry about the weather ruining their food. They wouldn't have to worry about being sick and not able to work and earn their food or someone raising the price, and it would just be laid out for them. And so when Jesus talks about heaven as a banquet, that's an inst. I mean, to us, I mean, we are watching our weight. We banquets that's you know it makes you fat you know we but to them it was the ultimate to think of of everything you could possibly want and it was served to you was just unbelievable but that's the picture Jesus gives of heaven but the lesson is it's heaven is shows us that we have a very amazing Jewish heritage the new Jerusalem the apostles and the 12 tribes Mount Zion and we're going to a banquet that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are already sitting down at which is really interesting to think about what that means. Okay, Jerusalem is big in God's word. The reason this is an element of biblical interpretation is that you have to understand what Jerusalem means because it occurs over 800 times in the Bible. That's just the times it's named. If you add the pronoun, pronom, pronomial, or however you pronounce that word that means all the usages of the pronouns for Jerusalem, it's a voluminous number of times it's referred to in the Bible. But Jerusalem is central to everything that God has revealed to us. And, and the more we understand that, the more that the pieces of the Bible fit together. The center of the world and of the prophetic universe is Jerusalem. Why do we say it's the center of the world? Because God says, I sit enthroned over Mount Zion. It's almost like the Lord, and I remember in a multi-dimensional world, if you think about quantum mechanics and everything else, that it's, it's very, very, dimensionality is very mathematically understandable if you're into that type of stuff. And we basically are in a three or four dimensional world depending on how you look at it you know the uh you know length breadth and depth and time would be the four dimensions but then when you add fifth and sixth and seventh and and some mathematicians have postulated there could be 12 or 14 dimensions you think about the fact that there was an interesting book written uh, about four decades ago called flatland if you ever heard about it, it was two-dimensional creatures they, they only had length and breadth. They had no height. And so the people that ruled over them had height. And it's just an interesting dimensionality book. But if you think about it, we all live in our little dimension that we live in like an ant farm. This is, I'm not an artist. This is the stand and that's the ant farm. An ant farm is only the thickness of an ant so you can see right through it. And so if you think about it, God is above time. So above the fourth dimension, up above it, and it, that dimension is all flat, and he can see it all at once. And because of that, it's like an ant farm that he can see through. And what he's saying is, Jerusalem is in the middle of the ant farm, and I've put my throne right over Jerusalem, and I'm looking down at everything. That's Isaiah 40. He says, I sit enthroned above all of you. And not just above you this moment, above all of you for all moments. At all times, I am sitting above everybody at all times. And that makes from the Bible the center of the world and of prophetic future events, Jerusalem. Jerusalem should be your favorite city after all because God said it's his favorite city. Look at 1 Kings eleven thirteen. 13. This is right after, if you remember, David's sin uh, and then the Lord's forgiveness and then that son that was going to be his heir was born, Solomon. And then Solomon had a son that he wrote the book of Proverbs to. Remember, Proverbs was written to Rehoboam. And the, when it says, my son, that's Solomon talking to Rehoboam. And Rehoboam was a rascal. Uh, he inherited none of his father's love for the Lord and all of his father's pride and arrogance and materialism. And so in 1 Kings 11, Jeroboam is getting the northern tribes, which in the Bible is called Israel. And Jeroboam is going to only retain the southern tribes, which in the Bible is called Judah. So the whole nation of Israel is divided 
in this civil war that's going to place, but, and it's kind of like ours, the north and the south, and Judah is the south, and Israel is the north. And the northern king is going to be a guy named Jeroboam, and he is a real bad guy. He's the one that starts the calf idols. And he puts one in the far north in Dan, he puts one in the south, Bethel. And so what he does is he puts a magnet for the Jews, one in the south border, one on the north border, and Jerusalem is actually right there. But he didn't want anybody from the north to go worship God there. So he says, I'll make you a convenient God-worshiping place. And since God is invisible and you don't like that, I'm going to make him visible. I'm going to make him out of gold for you. And he set up these golden calves. And so in that very tumultuous time, and by the way, what happened is everybody in the north that really cared about the Bible migrated down and came down here to Judah because they were still following the Bible. And basically that's what's happening across America right now. A lot of churches are kind of like becoming golden calves. You know, they're just giving people, they're telling them what they want to hear and giving them what they want and focusing on the material and everything else. And true Bible-believing people are slowly realizing that their churches are eroding their stand in the gospel and they're migrating to, just like in this scenario, where they all came down to where the word of God in Jerusalem. That moment reveals something for us. The prophet when he's explaining this plan of God to tear 10 tribes, by the way, 10 tribes were in the north, and two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, were in the south. And that's all that, that uh, Rehoboam retained. Jeroboam got the 10 northern tribes. But this is what the prophet said, however, I will not tear away the whole kingdom. There were 12 tribes. I'm only gonna tear, tear away 10. I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. And if you notice what God says, God says, Jerusalem's my city. He says it all the way through the Bible. And that's why every time the United Nations makes an edict about Jerusalem or every time America, you know, has, you know, uh, Lisbon 3 or whatever, it's very interesting that, that people don't acknowledge that it's not the UN or Jerusalem or Israel or anyone else. God, God has placed his ownership on Jerusalem. And, and I'll show you how important that is. It's interesting if you go through the Vatican or, or any, you know, on Google or anything, look at old maps. Most ancient maps put Jerusalem right in the center of the world. It's fascinating. Uh, they, in, in one sense, biblically, they were right. But what I want to talk about tonight is this. The reason that Jerusalem is so important is Jerusalem is like a countdown clock. It, it's like uh, a reminder of how long before departure. The final events of world history will culminate there, in Jerusalem. Think about it. Uh, people, in fact, at five o'clock, I had a meeting with the people that are going to Israel. And, they, and one of the questions was, um, do you think it's going to get dangerous over there? I said, do you think it's going to get dangerous? Have you read? <laughs> yes. But we do know that it survives, right? Because Jesus returns there and rescues the city. So it's probably the safest place to go. If there's a nuclear holocaust, Jerusalem survives. So move there if you are concerned. But the final events of world history culminate there with the glorious return of Jesus Christ to a literal spot. You know what's so interesting? In Acts 1, Jesus said that, that he was going to come back in like manner as they've seen him go into heaven. And, and it's, it's interesting that, that and, and I'm not teaching about the rapture and everything else, but Jesus was only seen by believing eyes. And Jesus came or went up to heaven blessing as a blessing to them. And he said, that's how I'm going to come back for you. The second coming to the Mount of Olives, Jesus is coming in flaming fire, taking vengeance, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, upon the world. It says that his whole white-robed outfit is splattered. He looks like a surgeon coming out of four hours of desperate surgery where they've got, they've, Blood has been aspirated all over the place, and he's got his mask on, he's covered with blood. Jesus is covered with blood. 
because he has been trampling out in Basra. The, the, he's been fighting uh, all of the enemies of the Lord, and he's got their blood on him. He comes in flaming fire. He touches down, causing an earthquake, making an unnatural darkness on the earth. It says everybody's crawling into holes and hoping the ground will swallow them up and asking the rocks to fall on them. Is that at all like he left? No. When he went in Acts chapter 1, he went blessing, pouring out his blessing on his people. Not one unsaved person saw him. Not one. He was never seen after the cross and the resurrection by lost people. That's his coming for us. Not at all to be confused with this return of Jesus Christ in flaming fire, touching down on Mount of Olives, which he does in Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is, is the backdrop for the end of the world. So that tells us that Jerusalem is God's countdown clock for humanity's survival. In other words, think about, and in just a moment, we're going to read the most extensive description and you can start looking for it in your Bible. It's the second to the last book of the Old Testament. And we're going to read all of chapter 12 and all of chapter 14. Think about when Zechariah was written. In fact, you can go today to Zechariah's tomb. Uh, it's the tomb of the prophets. It's on the side of the Mount of Olives. And remember, uh, that's where Christ is going to return. So Zechariah more than any other prophet describes this event. And what's amazing is he was sitting in Jerusalem looking at the Mount of Olives while he was writing under the inspiration of God's Spirit all these, these words. And what he says is that Jerusalem is how you're going to know by watching Jerusalem, you will know when the Lord's going to return. You're going to know. It's a countdown to Jerusalem. What he says is that the Lord returns when you see Jerusalem here completely surrounded by armies. And when those armies have broken through and ravaged two-thirds of the city. They've wiped out two-thirds and they've, the armies have it says, have pillaged and plundered and murdered and raped and, and destroyed two-thirds of the city. And when there's only one-third left, Jesus comes back. So I guess there is a sign for his coming, but it's kind of all happening at once, and so it's kind of hard, unless you're in it, to know. Because it's when Jerusalem is completely surrounded and only a third of the city is left. But... What's fascinating is if you read Zechariah, Zechariah wrote his work in about the 6th century B.C. What did Jerusalem look like in the 6th century B.C.? It was basically in ruins. It had a wall up that Nehemiah uh, had helped. Actually, he... Zechariah is written in the 500s, which is the 6th century B.C., and it's just, just parallel to the post. Remember a few weeks ago I told you that the, the nine of the minor prophets are before the exile, so they're called pre-exilic. That means they were written before uh, 586 B.C., and three are post-exile. That means they were written after 586 B.C. And uh, actually they were written, most of them, after 516. And they are Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. So those last three of the minor prophets, and Zechariah is right in the middle, are written in this time period when Jerusalem is all knocked down, burned, desolate, Nehemiah is coming back and motivating the people to build the walls in 52 days, which is unbelievable. Nehemiah's walls are still there. If you go to Jerusalem today, you can see them. In fact, there's some parts you can actually see some structures he built that are underneath um, what, what we would call the, the Temple Mount area. And you, there's tunnels under there and you can go through. But why I'm saying this is 
when Zechariah writes that Jerusalem is going to be, he actually says it's going to be the center of the whole world's attention. Uh, it, it, he said it's going to become a heavy burden for the whole world. When he wrote that, Jerusalem was a backwoods town, falling down, blackened, charred stones, far from any trade route, far from any seaport, far from anything. In fact, he's probably wondering, what's the deal? Who would want this city? It's broken down in ruins, and there's nobody, hardly 50,000 people living here. How come God says it's going to be the center of the world? Well, let's look at why. And this is why. When Jesus told his disciples about the future, remember Jesus spent more chapters on that sermon, this sermon, Actually, it goes Matthew 24 and 25, Mark 13, Luke 21. Jesus spends four chapters answering one question. Four chapters, and it's not just four chapters, it's four chapters in the most amazing time of his life. It's just before he gets crucified. It's almost the last topic he covers in the Gospels. And he talks about the future. The last full sermon Jesus delivers in four chapters is about the future. That's how important it is to God that we understand it. It's called the Olivet Discourse to theologians because it was written on the Mount of Olives. See, I mean, it was given. Jesus actually stood on the Mount of Olives looking at Jerusalem preaching this, this message. Uh, Jesus framed his words about the rest of the history of this planet by the sight of Jerusalem and all its earthly glory spread in front of him. Jesus centered everything that he explains to us about the future of earth. And he centers it on Jerusalem. If you look at, in fact, let's do that. Look at Matthew 24 and verse 2. We're going to come back to Zechariah. I just wanted you to practice finding it. But look at Matthew 24. We're going to read all of Zechariah, but I just want to show you this opener because I learned, um, I learned something when I was over in Japan. So interesting. Well, a little bit in Korea, but really in Japan. We were ministering to first-generation Christians. These are right, I mean, they just came from bowing down to the little Shinto shrines and all that stuff, and they got saved. And so when I would say, well, you know, it says in Matthew 24, they go, you know, well, they don't really do that. They go, because they're not real overt. They're very quiet people. The Japanese people are very quiet. But they would, they would go like this, and they'd say, wait. I'd say, what? They said, we want to see. I said, okay. So Matthew 24, 2. So I don't assume you know what it says. It says, and Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say unto you, not one stone will be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Verse 1, Jesus went out, departed from the temple. His disciples came to show him the buildings of the temple. Now look at verse 3. He sat on the Mount of Olives. Christ's very first words in Matthew 24, 2. All that he says about his second coming is introduced by those words. He said, keep your eye on Jerusalem. He said, I am ascending from the Mount of Olives. That's the center of Jerusalem then, and it still is. And I'm returning to the Mount of Olives. See, Jesus centered all of his teaching about the future on Jerusalem. He said, this is a focal point. And, and he wasn't allegorizing. Because remember, the first way to understand the scripture is, what was his intended message to the people he talked to? What did they think he was talking about? Did they think he was talking about Rome or the city of God or the church or something? No. He is talking about the Mount of Olives. They were sitting on it. He is talking about Jerusalem, the temple there. And when Jesus says, and there's going to be a temple there at the end, and there's going to be an abomination that Daniel talked about set up there, he's talking about a literal event. And so that's why Jerusalem is so important. Jerusalem is mentioned over 800 times in God's word. 
814 times the word Jerusalem occurs in the Bible in 766 verses. If you add to that all the time Jerusalem is alluded to by the word Zion and also the city of David, you get 206 more. There's also Salem, which is mentioned, uh, the first mention of Jerusalem, Salem, which is Melchizedek's city. So Jerusalem is a very important place. It's in Jerusalem God promised Christ's coming as the Lamb of God to Abraham. This is way back in the Old Testament in Genesis 22 on Mount Moriah. That's when God promised Jesus was coming and God would provide a lamb. And that's what John the Baptist pointed to Christ and said he was the one. So Jerusalem is where Christ's coming was first promised way back in Genesis. It was here in Jerusalem, David was promised a future son that will have an endless kingdom. That's why Jesus is called in Matthew, he's called in, in the promised one, he's called the son of David. Uh, Matthew is talking about Christ's royalty, his right to rule. And he's called the son. He's the future son that David was promised. And he is going to have an endless kingdom. And he is going to rule over the house of David. And, and that's why we believe in the millennium. That's when Christ rules. That's what Psalm 2 is about. When did Jesus rule with a rod of iron? And when did he shatter? Not during, I mean, he might have broken a few things during his cleaning the temple. He certainly, he had a cord of whips, not a rod of iron. Psalm 2 is talking about his millennial rule. And it was here in Jerusalem, God has, has worked the work of redemption. And that's probably why Jerusalem is the most important city that there ever has been. It's there that the one sacrifice forever that is not only liberating us from the penalty of sin, Sometimes all we think about is that. That sacrifice also liberated the universe. And, and Romans 8 says, will in the future cause the whole universe to be liberated from what we know in the laws of physics is the you know, entropy and, and heat exhaustion. The whole thing of everything is winding down to this black hole stuff, you know, where, where it's just going to be nothing. That is going to end. See, that's what, you know, when you think we have all these laws of science, well, when sin is finished, all those laws that are about decay and about, you know, heat death are going to end because it's going to, we're going to be liberated, it says. And so you can read that in Romans 8. Romans 8 is an amazing chapter when it talks about that the whole universe is groaning, waiting for the, the promise of redemption. This is the inanimate physical universe is captivated right now by sin. That's why, you know, things are exploding and things are, are decaying and, and the sun is exhausting its thermonuclear store. When you think of Jerusalem, and this is just one poet writing it, Jerusalem is huge if you step back. And if you've never done a study of Jerusalem, it, you know, Maybe next time you read the Bible through, look for all 800 of them. But Jerusalem, 3,000 years of lifetimes, Abraham and Isaac upon the altar of Moriah. Did you know that Moriah, where Abraham offered Isaac on the altar, that's in Jerusalem? It's the same ridge of rock that the temple's on today. It's been cut by the, the quarries, but it's the very same ridge of rock that goes from Mount Moriah down to the Temple Mount, down to the city of David. It's, it's one slope of rock. And it's been notched like this. They cut this part out, but this would be Calvary. Uh, now, Jesus' cross wasn't up there, but the hymn, There is a Green Hill Far Away, says it was. Actually, Jesus was crucified down on the road level, but they notched the Mount Moriah where Abraham offered Isaac, they've cut that and quarried rock that they used to build this up and build the, the Temple Mount platform. They basically moved it to there. But Abraham, in the same spot, this is Jerusalem, this is the city of David, the first Jerusalem, and this is Mount Moriah where, um, where Abraham offered Isaac. 
It's just a stone's throw from here to here to here. It's a very small area. Uh, this is only, this area here is only 40 acres, the Temple Mount, very small area. Um, David, the shepherd king, watching Bathsheba down here in the city of David, he was looking over his uh, balcony, watching Bathsheba from a distance. Jeremiah was thrown in a pit right here, in, in a pit right here uh, in the city of David, uh, mourning for the exiles. Jesus taught up here on this platform. This is the platform of the temple that was cut and notched from right there. Jesus taught there in the temple. Peter betrayed Christ. Uh, I mean, denied him, betraying his trust in him. Jesus walked the way of sorrows right there in Jerusalem. He died with forgiveness on his lips. And it's in the same spot right here in the, the Temple Mount area, especially on these southern steps that go down to the city of David, this is where Pentecost was. Um, that's the only place that you could get 3,000 people uh, that, that would hear the, there, there aren't stadiums there. But that was such a large area, the southern steps area, that Peter was shouting the good news uh, in the streets there, the people streaming up into the temple on the day of Pentecost. He was saying, he is risen, call in his name and live forever with him. And all of that redemptive history and a whole bunch more is all tied up in Jerusalem. Um, what's interesting is all this left of Christ Jerusalem is the Western Wall. That, I mean, that's visible uh, just out in the open. All this left from Christ Jerusalem is called the Western Wall. If you go there, one of the first things you notice are several large signs. In fact, you can't miss them. They're 10 feet tall. And they've been put up there by the Jews. And this is to understand what Jerusalem means to the Jews. This, this is uh, typed out what those signs say. Jewish tradition teaches the Temple Mount is the focal point of creation. Now these are unsaved Jewish people. These are the same Jews that were following the same religion that Christ was preaching the gospel to and the apostles. But this is what they believe. In the center of the mountain of Jerusalem lies the foundation stone of the world. Believe it or not, the Roman Catholics believe this too. Did you know that? Any of you good former Catholics? They believe that Adam, the Catholics and the Jews believe that underneath the city of Jerusalem, Adam was buried, the cross was right here, and the blood from the cross went down through cracks and touched Adam. That's Roman Catholic theology. Interesting. So they have a little correspondence with the, uh, and you can see all that today. There's a, a, a monument to it um, in uh, the church of the uh, Holy Sepulchre. But they say that Adam, uh, the foundation stone of the world is there. Adam came into being. They feel the Garden of Eden is actually in Israel. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob served God. They never write out the full name of God. That's how you can always tell that they're Orthodox, observant Jews, because they're not supposed to misuse the Lord's name, so they never spell it. The first and second temples were built on that mountain, Mount Moriah. The Ark of the Covenant was set on the foundation stone of the world. They believe that is where, right now, the Temple Mount platform, which you would know as the Dome of the Rock. The Jews believe that the Ark of the Covenant was set upon that foundation stone. That's why they are so excited about it. Jerusalem was chosen by God, that's true, as a dwelling place of the divine presence, that's true, the Shekinah. David longed to build the temple, that's true. Solomon, his son, built the first temple here about 3,000 years ago, that's true. See, this part, we're, we're not sure. Um, creation and Adam and everything, but this stuff is all true on their sign. Nebuchadnezzar destroyed it in 586, that's true. The second temple was rebuilt on its ruins 70 years later, that's true. That's Zerubbabel, that's what Haggai was writing about to rebuild the temple. Um, let's see, it was raised by the Roman legions over 1900 years ago, that's true, uh, in AD 70. The present western wall before you is a remnant of the western temple mount retaining wall. Jews have prayed in its shadow for hundreds of years, that's very true, an expression of their faith in the rebuilding of the temple. The sages said about it, the divine presence never moves from the western wall. I mean, you know, that's their lore. Uh, the divine presence is, God is omnipresent, but 
that's fine. The Temple Mount continues to be the focus of prayers for Jews all over the world. But I thought that's very interesting to give you an idea of what they believe. There are three reasons why Jerusalem is vital. It's because Jerusalem is God's city. I already showed you that. He said, it's my city, I chose it. Tonight, we're going to look at this. And then next month, we're going to see another element, which I think is fascinating. Most people never understand that God has used Jerusalem as the backdrop for all of his major, uh, beautiful, revelatory events. But tonight, it's God's city because God chose Jerusalem. 1 Kings 11.36, Unto his son I will give one tribe, and that David my servant may have a light always before me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen uh, me, I have chosen to put... I have chosen to put my name there. Sorry, I cut and pasted some extra words. Here's another one, Psalm 48. Great is the Lord, greatly to be praised in the city of our God, the mountain of his holiness. This is a, another word for Jerusalem. It's called the city of our God. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. So what they're saying is that the Lord is so associated with Jerusalem. Then it says in uh, verse 12 of Psalm 48, walk about Zion. Now they're talking about literal earthly Mount Zion, uh, which is in Jerusalem. Go around about her, tell the towers, mark her bulwarks, consider her palaces, that you may tell it to the generations following. David is extolling uh, the correspondence between the earthly and the heavenly. Uh, and then Psalm 87 this is fascinating. The Lord loves the gates of Zion. That's the city of Jerusalem, the gates into it. More than all the other dwelling places of Jacob, glorious things of thee are spoken uh, of you, O city of God. And so this, this reminds us, and I could just go on and on and show you, that God's city, God has chosen Jerusalem, and it's very important to him. But the last thing before we go tonight, Jerusalem is God's clock. It's like the countdown clock. It's like, uh, you know, so many movies have the atomic bomb ready to blow and there's a little countdown. It's getting closer and closer and finally the hero snips the cable and it stops. The problem is Jerusalem's clock is counting down and no one can snip the cable. And this is what God says. The close of world history is tied to this little city called Jerusalem. All the world, and I'll show you in just a minute, will focus on Jerusalem as the wrath of God is poured out in the tribulation. How tied Jerusalem is to tribulation is amazing. Fallen human history culminates with Christ's descent to the Mount of Olives, which is in Jerusalem. And the creator returns to Jerusalem to restore his fallen paradise. Do you understand the millennium is a partial return to paradise? There, there are no carnivorous animals. There are no poisonous snakes or spiders. There is no war. It's, it's a partial return. It's like a, a partial remo removal of the curse. And so much this fallen paradise or the millennium makes up, the promises in the Old Testament make up about 10% of the Old Testament are about this time when the whole world is coming to Jerusalem, when they're worshiping, when the whole world happens to get onto God's schedule. And I'll show you that in just a moment uh, in Zechariah. Here's Zechariah. You can follow along in your Bible. It's way too small for you to look at. This is all of chapter 12, okay? I just wanted to point out to you, the reason I put it up here is when Zechariah is sitting in Jerusalem, he couldn't believe that God was talking about where he was. Um, it's just amazing to think that he's sitting there in his little apartment in the old city of Jerusalem writing this manuscript. And as you read this, it says, the burden of the word of the Lord against Israel. So Zechariah, the prophet, post-exilic prophet in the sixth century is writing this. Thus says the Lord, and this is fascinating here. Um, what what he describes the Lord as. The Lord who stretches out the heavens. This is the cosmos. This, this is how God describes creation, which might answer a lot of people's questions about did the light from that, that our super, 
you know, Hubble telescope is detecting, did that light begin 14 billion years ago and make its way across the universe to get to the Hubble telescope for 14 billion, whatever it is, 13, whatever number they have these days? Or did God stretch out the heavens? And if he did so, where did he stretch them from? Well, what he said is, he's, God, his reference point of creation is the earth, where we are right now. And it says, he is the God who stretches out the heavens, the cosmos, from the earth outward. And so that would explain how we could have light from 14 whatever billion years ago and the earth not be that old because he stretched it out the equivalent of 14 billion light years in one direction. Uh, second thing, this is the geos. This is, you know, uh, the, the cosmos is the universe. The earth is the geos. He laid the foundation of the earth. And we know so little about our own planet. We, we can't penetrate more than seven miles or well, I don't know how deep they've drilled, but not very deep. We have all kinds of echo thoughts, but just the study of the, the you know, geodesy, the balance of the continents and the water and, and all the other elements of, of, the, of just the earth are just incomprehensible. But the Lord made the cosmos, he made the geos. And then there's a word right here. This is the pneumos. This is the, and, and I'm just saying, if you read the translation in Greek, you pick up He's the one that stretched out the cosmos. He's the one that laid the foundation of the geos, the earth. And he's the one that put the pneumos, the spirit, within man. So that's who's talking. Who else has that calling card? Who else can say, I have made the universe. I happen to have created the earth with all of its intricacies and laid the foundation. And by the way, I made you too. And that's who's talking to you, Zechariah. And I'm sure he sharpened his pen, you know, or pencil. And... And the Lord says, this is what I want you to write down. Verse 2. Behold, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding people. What's a cup of drunkenness? It's where someone keeps drinking and they don't even know that, that they're harming themselves. I mean, read God's philosophy of drinking sometime in Proverbs. He says that it's a person who, who sits on top of a mast and doesn't know that they're in danger. It's someone who has wounds and they don't know where they came from because they are so drunken that they are doing things they shouldn't be doing. That's what Jerusalem's going to become. People are going to be drunken. All the surrounding people around Israel are going to be not literally drinking alcohol, though they might, but Muslims don't. But they're going to be so intoxicated with getting Jerusalem that they're going to lay siege on Jerusalem. They're going to finally say, we're going to get that city. We're going to have it at last. It's always been a contention point. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem, look at what God says, Jerusalem's going to become a very heavy stone for all peoples. I'm sure right about now, Zechariah's going like this. And he goes, who even knows we're here? We're nobodies in the backwoods. He said Jerusalem is going to become all, all the nations of the earth are going to be gathered against it. It doesn't say all the nations that are in Mesopotamia or in the, you know, Middle East, it says the whole geos, the whole earth is going to be united. If you think people don't like Israel now, just wait. It's going to be universally hated by everybody on earth. Everybody's going to send their sons to join the army to go destroy Israel. In that day, the Lord says, the Lord gets involved I'm going to strike every horse with confusion, every rider with madness. I will open my eyes in the house of Judah. I will strike every horse of the people with blindness. And the governors of Judah will say in their heart, the inhabitants of Jerusalem are my strength, the Lord of hosts of God. And that day I'll make the governors of Judah like a fire pan and a wood pile, a fiery torch. They will devour the surrounding peoples in the right hand and the left, but Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place. The Lord... Verse 7, we'll save the tents of Judah first, and the glory of the house of David, and the glory of the inhabitants will not become greater than Judah. And that day, look at this, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The one who is feeble among that day will be like David. We only have two minutes left. 
Do you know anything about David? As far as we know, David never lost a single battle, and David was never even wounded once. He fought hand-to-hand combat. He had to be this close to people. He killed them with his sword, it says. In fact, the reason God wouldn't let him build the temple is he said he was a bloody man. Literally, David would come back from his hackathons covered with gore. That's the only way you kill people with a sword. You slash and you cut and stuff spills. It says the, the feeble, the most feeble person in the last days in the Jews, the feeblest one is going to be like David who never got wounded and never lost a battle. And the house of David will be like God, the, the angel of the Lord. What was the angel of the Lord like? One time the angel of the Lord struck just one boom and killed 180,000 Assyrian soldiers. Angel of the Lord's pretty powerful. See, these euphemisms or these metaphors, these, these pictures are powerful. And then here's the good part, and it's time to go. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So see, everyone gets saved the same way. You know, when it says in, in Romans 9, 10, and 11 that all Israel will be saved, they're saved the same way we do. God initiates, he pours out at this climactic moment. Do you remember I told you that two-thirds of Jerusalem are, if, if you read the rest, are destroyed. They're coming in, they're pillaging, plundering, raping, and murdering and all the armies, and only the remnant, only the third is left. And the Lord on them pours out his spirit of grace and supplication. And in that instant, they look on me. Wait a minute. Who's talking here? The word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord. They will look on me whom they pierced. I'll never forget doing what I just did with you with a Jewish man flying on LL who was so enchanted. He was a rabbi, had the full beard and all the stuff, you know, and the, all the tassels and everything. And he was eating his sandwich and he says, how come you're reading the Old Testament? I said, can I show you what I just found? And I did this. I said, I was just reading this. I said, look at this verse. I said, you can read English, can't you? And I will pour out on this house of David. He said, that's our Tanakh. I said, yeah, it sure is. It's the prophet Zechariah. On the inhabitants of Jerusalem, yay, Jerusalem. He was all excited, chewing faster. The spirit of grace and supplication, and they will look on me. And I just drew a line. I said, who's talking there? The Lord, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, God, me, whom they pierced. I said, when did God get pierced? He shoved his sandwich in and walked away. Wouldn't talk anymore. You see, it's so clear what the Lord's going to do. And we're going to pick up there next month because it's 716. So, sorry, I get carried away when I talk about Jerusalem. But it is the most mentioned place in the Bible. Let's all stand. And as you stand, you say, why would we study Jerusalem? Because it's God's time clock. And God says that when you see Jerusalem as a very heavy stone for all people where the president of the most powerful nation in the world is spending an inordinate amount of time trying to solve the problems of Jerusalem and so have all the previous presidents. And when all the nations of the earth, like the United Nations, are voting against Israel every time they can, then you should know that you're getting near something interesting. And that's what the Lord says. Let's bow before him in prayer. Father, I thank you tonight that your word is true and that you have revealed your mind to us. And I pray that we would study your word and understand it and allow the confidence to come that the one talking to us is the one that stretched out the entire universe, that laid the foundation of this planet upon which we stand and live, and that you are the one who even created each of us. And when you speak as creator, we should listen. And I pray that we would make time. This is the beginning of a new week. And I pray that in any way we've fallen short of making room in our lives for you, that you'd give us a new beginning today. And we would say, I'm going to make it my goal to listen to the voice of God through his word every day 
this week. And if we fail, it's only one step back. And I pray that we'd become people who are filled with your truth. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go.